Today, I'm delighted to welcome Caroline Kidd from Changing Leans. And Caroline is one of the few leading Irish females in the motor industry. And she has a very unique business and unique interest in motors. And we're going to start now. And Caroline, good to talk to you again. Hi, Mags. It's lovely to see you again. And lovely to hear from you as well. And great to see all the activity you're up to Um in your own little lane um, with changing lanes and also with all the motor. It's great to see a female, actually. That sounds awful now in this day and age, but it is genuinely great to see uh, a female and an Irish female as well. Um, you're so active in this respect. Tell us a little bit about your business. Well, Mags, my business is called Changing Lanes and Changing Lanes started out as a motoring blog, which I started back in 2014 basically from my bedroom you know um I was 27 years old and I was enthusiastic about the opportunities that the internet presented to me I had studied journalism in college but there were no graduate jobs for journalists I really had to take everything into my own hands so I started experimenting with wordpress.com and I started changing lanes.ie on that that platform so I bought the url changing lanes.ie and I still use that business name today eight years later which I'm really proud of as well and I have reviewed over 400 cars in that time so I really have a great I suppose a great amount of experience now in reviewing cars and it certainly got easier as the years went on and I built up my experience so the site has grown over the years and it's now very well regarded in the Irish motor industry and among consumers and changing lanes ranks very well in search engines so when people go to search for a car review you're you're pretty sure to find a review written by me so I've also in the last few years, I have created a services arm to Changing Lanes. So in 2020, I launched Copywriting by Changing Lanes. And I had been doing copywriting for business clients before that, but I was working under a different business name. So I really wanted to bring it all together under the one business name. And that was a really good decision. So I offer a series of copywriting services for business, content creation services. So I do a lot of website copywriting and also content creation. So blogs and articles. And I've written editorial for a number of um, media clients. And I also produce content for carzone.ie. They, um, I do video presenting with them so that's fantastic I really love doing that so that's pretty much that's brilliant all that I do Mags there's probably more stuff as well I seem I'm to not, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> can I ask you something where did you get your interest for cars from where did that come from so I've loved cars since I was a very small child and there's no family member really that had a huge interest in cars, but I do remember playing with toy cars as a child. So obviously somebody gave me this collection of toy cars and I began reading all the car magazines then when I was in my teenage years. And I used to play all those video games about cars Gran Turismo and Colin McRae rally so <laughs> I learned I was almost like self-educated I suppose I even used to read the numbers in the back of the magazines where they'd have all the specs the horsepower the zero to 100 yeah. kilometers per hour so even before I even knew what a motoring journalist was I was kind of training for it if that makes sense that's so true actually yeah that that's actually what it sounds like and have you come across any other females in the industry here in Ireland I mean there is women working in the motor industry here in Ireland and in the UK in Europe when I was a child Vicky Butler Henderson was one of my mm. idols she was writing content 
uh, writing reviews for Top Gear magazine and she was on the TV as well. So she was certainly one of my early idols and I got to interview her for Changing Lanes, I think last year, the year before, which I was so happy about. There's also Geraldine Herbert here in mm. Ireland. She's very prolific as well. And Sinead McCann at Cars Ireland. She would be one of my peers. So it's great to see women working in the industry, but we need more women writing about cars yeah. and all aspects yeah. in the dealerships as well, because the more women there is, it changes the atmosphere as well. Even in a dealership, it changes the atmosphere and it, it makes it a more welcoming and I suppose inclusive place for women so we certainly certainly need more female voices um in in all aspects of the industry mm, I agree with you I agree with you and I think I think um I grew up around machinery and I wouldn't so much have an interest in cars, but I would always have an interest in large machinery. And um, I suppose it's it's hard to find somebody else who had that interest, um, but it's nice to see it happening. And it's nice to see women driving, pardon the pun, or carving out their own um, little area in the marketplace. I think it's really important because it needs to be all inclusive now more so than ever. On the subject of cars, we're coming up to Christmas and I suppose everybody, not everybody, but I suppose people are going to be more uh, aware of any purchases or changes they're going to make with regards to motor vehicles in 2023. Um, and also economy is, is a huge factor at the moment. I know I'm driving a diesel. Um, the price of fuel has hugely influenced our pockets and our budgets recently, and that's not going to change. It has come down and steadied somewhat. But can we talk a little bit a minute about the electronic option? What do you where do you see this going? And, and do you think it's actually a good thing that it's coming into the marketplace? So the future seems to be electric cars. Now, there are some companies working on um, hydrogen cars, but the electric car seems to be the most efficient and I suppose the most realistic at the moment because electric cars are already here. And at the moment, they count for about just under 15% of the Irish new car market. Diesel sell sales have declined rapidly and because we used to be a huge diesel market. Yeah. Now, not all countries in Europe are even as advanced as we are, and some countries are more advanced. So I think we're doing quite well, but the cost is an issue at the moment. You're still paying a lot more for an electric car, though there are some new brands coming into the market that are offering some good value on electric cars so certainly i think the range of the cars has improved a lot so you can get over 300 kilometers from on one single battery charge so it makes it more realistic especially if you're living in rural ireland um which i am because <laughs> when you're when you're living i mean i've i grew up in wexford i spent a lot of my professional life in wexford i'm in kildare now and I mean, you're constantly in the car when you live in a, in rural Ireland. You're always driving somewhere, you know. So the, the thing about electric cars is that, yeah, you have to be able to charge at home, I think, so that you're leaving your home with a full battery charge. And then perhaps you only need to charge it once a week. You might even be charging that car every day. But the public charging network is getting better, but... There's so many new EVs being registered that there's a lot of demand on some of those public charging points, particularly on the motorways at busy times. So the bank holiday weekend or during the summer. And I don't know about you, but I get fed up sitting around in uh, motorway service stations waiting for a car to charge. And so from a convenience side, it can work but it can be awkward at times as well. There is something quite nice about getting into a diesel car and seeing a range of maybe a thousand kilometers in some cars, but the fuel prices have been really crazy. It's been so challenging and they have come down. Yeah, um, they have. In the last few weeks at last. 
so look it's 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 tricky um for consumers at the moment has also been supply issues with new yeah, cars. Yeah, huge supply issues. Even with electric cars as well, probably more EVs would be sold if the su- supply had been up to speed, but it hasn't. Um, and that's a global issue, you know. So there's challenges, but uh, I think electric is the future. And there is something about, you know, for the environment, I mean, like sitting in traffic and knowing that your car is not spilling out fumes, particularly in built up areas in towns and cities. I think there's now a, a moral obligation not to be spewing out fumes in, you know, very populated cities and towns. Mm-hmm. If you can go for even a hybrid, hybrids can run quite efficiently in town and city driving. They can be a good halfway house. Um. I changed my car actually um, earlier this year and it was down to complete practicalities. Um, The car that I had been driving, which I loved dearly, um, decided to start lighting up and obviously that led to more problems and it wasn't an old car at all. And when I went to look for a car, I thought I'll try for a hybrid and I found it impossible to find one um, at the time. So I'm with I'm on a diesel model now, but I know that going forward, I will most definitely be looking at a hybrid or an, or an EV because I do feel we have a moral obligation. I do think it's the way the market is going as well. Um, I, I, I too have heard about and I've, I've heard it from some of our own clients and um, business owners that would have a number of vehicles on the road and they're they're waiting. They're on waiting lists for EV now for the EV um, alternative. And there is an added expense with it, but long term, there's a saving with it. And you're also you're you're ticking that environmental piece as well personally and professionally um we have a colleague here romaine she drives an electronic car and it's it's brilliant i just think it's like an airplane that you don't hear it's like this magic carpet drives into the drive here at the office um but like that she she would say to me you know, Mags, it's brilliant. I love it. It doesn't cost me anything to come to work, but she has to make sure that it's fully charged and she can only go within a certain distance. It's a small EV. Um, so there is that peace of mind thing. And I think that's going to be a mindset change for a lot of us Irish because we like to know there's fuel in the tank and we can get from A to B. Um, and my car is a perfect case in point this morning. The light went on. The fuel is low. Um, so I had to to pull in, but I knew the fuel was going low. So I'm, I, you know, it's it's a bit more of a panic thing if there isn't an EV charge point within a certain distance um of where you are. But I think there's been efforts made by government now as well to I know they're funding um EV charge points in residential um areas as well, which is very welcome um, and very much needed too. So I think there will be a big change over. Tell us a little bit about some of your favorite motors, Caroline. Oh, wow. Gosh. Oh, but that's, the, it's so funny. I mean, when you ask me that question, I've driven so many cars. I've been so lucky. I've driven sports cars, SUVs, hatchbacks, saloons, everything. And there's less performance cars now. Um, being I suppose launched and going on press fleets I had some great times in you know the hot hatchback like the Renault Megane (laughs) RS the Ford Focus RS I had some bizarre experiences you know in in cars where pinch me moments you know maybe driving a a hundred thousand euro Land Rover Discovery and just me just about the age of 30 at the time you know and somebody's given me the keys to this car and I look at the the price of it and I'm like oh my goodness you know where am I going to park this thing and is it going to be safe and um so I've driven a lot of I've driven everything Mags so from your Dacia Dusters right up to Gosh, what's the most luxurious thing? Probably that Land Rover Discovery. I remember it was absolutely massive. So I love all cars. Um, you know, even something like a Renault Clio, one liter. And what do you drive yourself? <laughs> what do you drive yourself? Well, I used to have a Volkswagen Golf. Of course. I mean, it's the most 
Yeah, One yeah. Of the world's most famous cars. I was just a, it was a 1.4 petrol. So that was a car I bought myself with my own money when I got my first job. Um, and I had it for about, gosh, I think it was about eight years, maybe. Mm. So I kept it. And then in the last five years, I've been driving what we call press cars. So it's a car that you would get from the brand to review. I've been driving those back to back for the last five years so I wasn't driving my own car and it was getting problems because it was quite old so I had to move on you know and uh, let it go but um, yeah so it's I've been driving so many cars I just don't I don't have the time to drive my own car yeah so what would you what would you look for if you were going to buy a car now in January or if you if somebody was what would you advise somebody to be aware of um, if they're changing their car, if they're buying a new car? And also on that, would you would you say buy a new car or would you recommend that you trade in for maybe something that's a few years old? I think the there's actually so much demand in the used car market mm-hmm. that the prices have gone up of the cars so I mean I there's lots of really great new models I suppose I would be looking for something that's fuel efficient um I would still find it find it hard to go full electric I think um I'd probably buy a small fuel efficient petrol car really myself there is some great EVs but I think at the moment where the technology is, they make the most sense in small compact cars because we've seen trends in the motor industry in the last few years towards SUVs, which are quite heavy, big cars. Mm. So a lot of them have these big batteries in them. And I just don't know, is that a bit counterintuitive for the environment? So if you can buy a smaller car, I think just to think about what exactly do I need, you know, um, it can be more efficient in the long run, I think, you know, a better, a better choice for the environment and for you. They're easier to park as well. <laughs> yeah, that is true. They are easier to park. Although I remember my dad telling me when I was learning to drive, Max, the bigger the vehicle, the easier it is to park. And, you know, sometimes I think he, he has a point there. Um, the other thing as well, Caroline, I just wanted to ask you, right? Um, and this is a question more for me, because where I live, we need an all wheel drive. It's just a fact of life, unfortunately. Um, so if you were to pick maybe one or two all wheel drives that you think, yeah, they're good. You should look at them. Um, what would they be? on the spot there now I didn't mean to the car I'm driving at the moment is um I'm actually driving this week I'm driving a Mazda CX-60 and it's all-wheel drive and it's a plug-in hybrid so brilliant okay a bit of everything it's electrified you know you so you can plug it in let me write that down (laughs) (laughs) Mazda are really good cars I have to say I really do like them um, they're very nice to drive and they've really upped the quality over mm. the last few years so even a Mazda CX-5 all-wheel drive is a good car um, trying to think it's funny you, you have caught me on the spot oh here, I'm sorry I didn't mean hmm. to but it's, it's funny actually when I was when I'm looking at cars I was never really into cars Caroline right to be fair I loved big machinery and tractors which is a funny one um a city girl but I was half rare in the country um and the first thing I was put on to drive bar from a bicycle was a tractor um so I think I got my interest from there but when I started driving the car it never really bothered me about the brand and it's funny now looking at everything I've ever gone for They've always been really strong, you know, dependable. You know, I had a Volkswagen um, when I started a Polo and I bought her and I loved her to death. Um, I think there wasn't a a county in Ireland that car wasn't in at one stage. And then I bought an Opel Astra. And then that was another workhorse, actually. That car was was a workhorse. 
the strongest car I've ever driven was the Skoda Superb. Um, yeah. My God, my God. It never let me down. It was an executive model. It was a beautiful model to drive, really comfortable. The boot was huge, which was great for me with work. And the back of the car was huge. And it just, it was when my daughter was quite small as well. And I actually, it broke my heart actually to get rid of it. But it was time to go. But it was just, um, I have to say they are a brilliant brand. Mm -hmm. um, particularly that model as well, the Skoda Superb. They're a really, really strong, sturdy car. They, they're nearly bulletproof, to be honest, in my opinion. Um, and then I had a Merc for a while and it caused me nothing but trouble, <laughs> which is unusual for a Merc. Um, but I think I was cursed in that respect. And I think what other models have I driven? I've driven, I had a Jag, an F-Pace. Um, oh, I love those. They're yeah, they're lovely. That's the one yeah. I changed recently. It started causing me an awful lot of problem and problems. Jags are great, but once they start causing you trouble, you know, you're into high fees and a lot of trouble they'll they'll just continue to cause you trouble and i'm now driving a volvo and yeah. the volvo is she's a little she's a little workhorse as well which um, model is it max it's a uh, xc uh 40 oh brilliant one. and yeah. she's a redesigned one so she's she's two liter um and I couldn't believe she was two litre. When I got into her, you could feel the power under the hood, as the man says. And she's really, you feel really safe, um, particularly when I'm driving with my daughter and her friends or whatever in the car. And I would do a good bit of mileage every year. So it's that peace of mind thing as well. And, and we live in rural Ireland, real rural Ireland. So we have to we have to be able to get up and down these roads, regardless of weather conditions. Um, so it's that peace of mind thing. I think you're right in what you said. You have to look at what do you need and what's practical. Um, but I'm adamant that the next model I get is possibly it'll probably be a hybrid because I'd be slow to go fully electronic. Um, I think it's that Irish thing, you know, we're slow to change. We'll just tiptoe around it and do a bit at a time. But um, I, I'd love, I love watching some of the car programs as well. They're, they can be fierce, interesting and frightening too. <laughs> <laughs> when you see the speed of some of those motors go at, but no, it's, it's really good. And come here to me in terms of when you're not in the car, what are you doing? Oh, well, I mean, I think. COVID certainly made me readdress the whole work-life balance thing. And I think when my work life got somewhat quieter, I wasn't reviewing cars every week. So I reconnected with some childhood hobbies like baking, drawing, and I love cooking. And I love running and being outdoors going to the mountains yeah yeah and i do some tai chi as well which is oh really my god relaxation. yeah my mum swears by that caroline she yeah. absolutely swears by it and and being outdoors i feel myself as well like i'd always love being out getting a bit of fresh air particularly what i do you know you need to just switch off sometimes and i have to say now and i'm going to give him a plug here the local GA grounds in Hollymount here in just outside Castlebridge, Shelmalier's uh, grounds was a life saver for me. Um, I think as well, and still is. You know, I love going up there and walking on my own and just doing rounds of it. And it's just to keep that balance to get away from your screens, to get away from your phone, to get away from the car as well, because driving is tiring. Um, you need to be really switched on and stop for your cup of coffee and, and all that jazz, you know, arrive alive, as the man says. And it's something that I'd be very aware of now. Um, and walking a bit more as well when you can for me to be, which isn't that often here in, in where we're living, but still just get out and be mindful of having that little bit of balance when you can, I think is hugely important. Absolutely. And I grew up in Wexford and grew up in the countryside so I absolutely adore the outdoors I was about 20 minutes from Mount Leinster you know growing up and I still love to go there as an adult I love when you go on one of those big walks and you're out in the wilderness when you have that realization that I haven't seen another person for like an hour you know I yeah. love that um 
So certainly I do try to stay balanced because I love my work and a lot of self-employed people love what they do. We love mm. what we you wouldn't do it. We wouldn't twice. do it. Yeah, we no, we wouldn't. No, you couldn't. You couldn't. You couldn't. And so we see that every day. But it can be stressful. It can. And I suppose I've I've learned I think COVID did help me realize that if I if all this stopped in the morning, I'd be fine, you know, that I'm more than my work, you know, as well. I suppose I learned I learned that too, because you can take things very personally. Well, I did. I, I think I took things quite personally. So when business is going well, when you're really connected to your, your business, things are going well. And it's like, great. And then there is peaks and troughs in business. Mm. Things do Absolutely. Go and that's then. the nature of the beast, I think, Caroline, you know, and that's something as well. If there's business owners listening to this, that it's OK to have bad days in business. You know, you, you, and it's OK to have great days in business. There's yes. absolutely nothing wrong with it. And um, there is a thing in Ireland called the art of the begrudgery. And you have to just have to have selective here. And I think on that piece, you have to kind of just go, I'm driving my own car here. I'm driving my own business yeah. and, you know, take stock and sometimes and acknowledge what you've achieved and how far you've come. And acknowledge as well when there's an issue, where there's a challenge and and ask for that help to get through it. Because look, at that's real life. And there isn't a business that doesn't have a challenge at some point. You know, um, we're seeing that all the time here. That's that's what we deal with every day, all day. Um, I love it because I love solving problems, but it can get a grip and get a hold of you. And something that you said there as well about COVID really taught us to look at things a little bit differently. I know personally, um, we were hammered um, in, in like we were up to our eyes during COVID, just helping clients and supporting business owners as much as we could. But also I was homeschooling. Um, my husband was frontline. So there was all that going on as well. So there was the real life stuff. But you know what it taught me, Caroline? I was so grateful that I had space around me to walk, that I could get out in the air. Um, the one thing, and we, we spoke about it there before we came on air, I found it really difficult not to shake someone's hand or not to give yes. someone a hug. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see my mom for 10 months. And I think that was the toughest thing. You know, it's kind of, I'd always speak to my mother every single day I speak to my mother. But now I'm very... I would do that as a reflex action before COVID. Now I'm mindfully doing it every single day because we don't have those people with us forever. And and to kind of take the time to connect with those friends that you haven't seen in a while. Um, and to remember that you are not your business. You are your business, but it's not you. It's not your 100%. You have other stuff that makes you you as well, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, so I think that's you know. what I learned from COVID, I, I really think it helps me to take a step back and realize that life goes on as well. And that, yes, you're more than your work. I had to learn that lesson, I suppose, Mags, you know, because I had started the business when I was, I was still in my 20s and it was kind of all I knew, really, you know, and I had decided early on that I wanted to be my own boss and I wanted the I suppose it sounds quite quite dramatic but I wanted to be a master of my own destiny I wanted each day to be my my day you know obviously when you're self-employed and you run your own business you know people think you've got a lot of freedom and independence yes you do but at the same time you have to do work you have to get clients and you have to deliver results for your clients so there's freedom but at the same time no you've got to show up every day and do work and you've got to do business development you have to do everything and I certainly would have struggled with that I had to learn how to balance all of that and that's a work in progress I think it's something I continually work at trying to get balance and you're always adjusting I think as a business owner and um, and I work by myself. I suppose I don't have a team. I I did want to, I wanted to create a business that would suit my, me as a person and mm. what I wanted from my life. I 
I wasn't the type who would wanted to create like an agency and have loads of people working for me. That's never been my dream. And it is for some people. And I think that's great. Like people who really contribute to the economy, economy by creating more jobs. I, I think that's fantastic. But for me, it was, I remember hearing the term in a start your own business course that I did maybe, gosh, 10 years ago. And it was that some people want to create a lifestyle business. And in many ways, I think that was it. I wanted to create a job for myself that would fit the lifestyle I wanted. Um, my work is very creative, so it needs space to 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 be the best it can and to grow. If I'm doing Develop, content yeah. for a client, I put a lot of thought into that. And I go and I interview the client and I get to know their business and I get to know them as well. Mm -hmm. I think when you're doing something like copywriting or content creation for a client, you probably find this with marketing as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. You really have to get to know them and you have to be invested. You want you have to want them to do well. It's funny you mention that because we had a client here this morning. They're a food business. They're they're have 40 plus staff in the business. Um and we do a lot of different work. We do funding appraisals, um, business strategies, um, sales and marketing strategies, one-to-one -one work with business owners like yourself. And one thing that we were just talking about with this business owner, um, they started off as one person. And I and I'm delighted to see how much they're progressing. And I love to see that happening for 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 genuine hearty people that just want to do a bloody good job um i think that one of the things that i always say and i think you've heard me say this before is build the business that you want around you not put you around the business um, and it's one of the things that i wanted to do when i started the business as well caroline was and i'm very upfront about this I would never want to be a multi-agency piece. That's not my gig. Um, I want to support um, real support to business owners when they need it and if they need it and when they're ready as well to focused and committed ones. Um, and I think you there's no there's no set fit. It has to fit you, right? Yes. You know, it's like it's like shoes. They come in all sizes for a reason. So I think businesses come in all shapes and sizes as well. And you have to build something that's going to fit you and suit you, not build yourself to suit the business. Obviously, you need to learn as you go along. That's mm. that's part of the course. But it can if it's a painful piece, you won't want to get out of bed in the morning and do it. That's really exactly. a simple. And why would you? Why would you put yourself through that? Um, I'm just conscious of my time. I've taken up so much of your time already. <laughs> Come here before. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's been really nice. And can I just ask you something, Caroline? How is Kildare since you made the big leap? Oh, it's fantastic. I suppose I moved because I got busier. I was on the road to Dublin more because I swapped press cars on a Monday and then I was traveling up to Dublin again to do filming with the car zone team so I was spending more time in the car and I just didn't want to live like that you know I wanted yeah, more hours yeah. in my day life got very busy again when Ireland opened up again I think everybody has found that 100% yeah and I wanted the balance so I I've moved here and I'm very excited about I suppose the opportunities to connect with the local business community here yeah I started my business in Wexford it's very dear to my heart and I met so many lovely people in Wexford people who still support me and who are my you know my friends on Facebook and they they, they uh, applaud anything I do they're they're great um but I I'm really excited about connecting with the local business community and I've visited the chamber here a few times and I know Wexford Chamber was excellent for me it really helped me to grow my business and get to know people and just just to talk to other business mm. people who are in the same shoes as you are yeah so yeah and that's hugely important because sometimes if you're an independent business owner it can be a lonely place and you know let's be honest it's 
I don't talk to my business. I don't talk about my business outside of my business, really, because to be truthful, there isn't many people that I know personally that would be interested in listening to it. First of all, why would they? But there's not many business owners in that circle either. And that's absolutely fine. But you do need to be able to talk to someone that's in a similar situation to yourself from time to time. And I think networking is so important and just connecting with people. It's not all about it's not about generating mm. a business deal or a new client all the time. Mm. Obviously, that's part of it. You're not running a charity, you're running a business. However, um, I think just being able to speak to people that are in a similar situation to yourself and being able to pick up the phone and maybe, you know, have a cup of coffee with somebody who's mm. also a business owner. I think it's it's hugely important. Um, I'm going to say good luck to you now. But before I do, um, it's changinglanes.ie, correct? That's right. And um, we all should look up out for Caroline. And I mean that I've seen you on the Car Zone videos. Um, so please do support her. She has a great business and um, you might learn a thing or two about how to drive that car and stay in your lane. So Caroline, listen, have a lovely Christmas and we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. That's Mags. Mags Bowl and Murphy for signing off from Business Time Live. Ladies and gents, this will be loaded onto our blog and we hop onto boffinconsultancy.com over the coming weeks to listen. Many thanks and happy Christmas. <laughs>